last speaker for the afternoon is Fabian Scalzo. He's an assistant researcher, um, also at uh, in LA, but in this case at the neurosurgery um, department at uh, the UCLA Hospital and neural in the neural working in the neural systems and dynamics lab. And he will present his work on pattern recognition methods for efficient alarm-based patient monitoring. So I think that will dovetail very nicely on the previous slide. Yeah, it's perfect timing. Perfect schedule. <laughs> Take the <coughs> oh no, we did it. Oh. and I'm going to talk to you about how can machine learning um, be used to improve monitoring systems in the ICU. So it's related to what they was presenting. And um, so I'm from UCLA, uh, which is a big hospital. It's about 500 beds. It employs more than a thousand nurses, and it's about 40,000 uh, ER admissions per year. And I work in a, in neurosurgery with. With different, uh, with people from different backgrounds, like some of them are neurosurgeons, some of them are computer scientists, and some of them are biomedical engineers, and we work together um, on problems such as the intensive care unit. And when you look at it from a perspective of, of a computer scientist, the intensive care unit is actually an intensive data analysis center, and it, it has some similarities with other. Uh, control rooms where you have lots of data, such as like, um, like the control room of a nuclear power plant here, or for the cockpit, cockpit of an aircraft. Um, the difference is that the pilot is the nurse, and she's driving the recovery of the patient using uh, different devices, um, as it was uh, introduced by Dave earlier. So those devices can be helpful to to provide assistance for. For example, for respiratory assistance or medication administration automatically. And some of the devices are just monitors. They just continuously monitor some vitals from the patient and they, um, and they report that on, on, on those screens, different screens, different monitors for different things, such as uh, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature. So when there's something wrong, like if the value is abnormal, there is a sound that, that, that is triggered by those monitors and, and it attracts the attention of the nurse, which in turn take the appropriate action to, to solve the problem, right? So it looks like a pretty good setting and um, in, in theory, it should work pretty well. The issue is that 85% of the amount are false, are, they are false positive, which means that it has it, it caused two major problems. One of them is recognized as alarm fatigue, which which is related to the nurse, because most of the most of the alarms are false, so the nurse get used to that and she she actually don't pay as much attention anymore, and and so that's that's kind of dangerous for the patient because they don't react as quickly as they could, um, and so it's a really recognized problem in the ICU. The other problem is about patient, it's, a, it's also dangerous for the patient in the sense that if you have 10 different alarms that are ringing at the same time next to your bed, well, you're not going to rest very well, right? You're going to, so it's going to make your recovery at least longer, and, and in some cases, it, it may affect your, even your, your recovery success, sorry. Um, so alarms can ring independently anywhere, anytime. It's not related, it's not connected. Um, 
So it's a bit, well, a way to see it is, it's a bit messy. If you don't, you, you just enter there and you don't know about it, you're going to think it's, it's just a mess. I, and you would not think that they could make sense of it. But the nurses are qualified and experienced and they can make sense of it. Because mainly they have ex experience about the physiology and they know, well, this patient, we know what, what is, what is having, uh, what he, he is having. And we know that we can, some of the, the monitors are not relevant. We can re even shut them down and it's going to be fine. Um, so we, they can act on that to improve their knowledge and like to, to, to really refine what they understand about the patient. That's one thing. Um, the other field of action is about engineering and like trying to improve the sensors and reduce the, like their, their sensitivity to noise. Um, so that's something that, that can be done. But the thing that, that interested me and like, um, some of you here, I think, uh, it's about machine learning and pattern recognition. And it's actually a pretty good setting to, to be applied. And um, so in this talk, um, well, once you have a model, um, it's another thing to, be, to have it approved by the staff and like, to, to implement it in real life. But if you have a model that works well and like, that can solve man, most of these issues that, that we mentioned as false positive, then I, I believe that it will take time, but, but nurses and clinical staff will eventually approve it. It may, may take years, but if it works very well, they will appreciate it, that it doesn't ring 85% or nothing. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to, to present two works that we did. One of them is about reducing a single source of alarm. So we want to, we're going to focus on one single type of alarms, and we're going to try to reduce it. The other one is to try to, to really apply some machine learning and try to see if, if among those different alarms, these hundreds of different alarms that are, that are triggered at any time, is there a pattern there that we can actually use to find really useful um, um, like, like critical events? So can we mine that information and make make a sense of it. So that's, that's the second work I mean to show you. So unlike uh, what uh, they presented, we are actually lucky at UCLA. We have the ability to, to monitor uh, 200 beds in real time. And each monitor is connected to a, a GE network, which uh, records not only uh, the alarms, but also the waveforms and the signals. So we have access to raw data. So that's very important because if we don't have data, well, that limits what we can do, right? So we have access to those data and they are matched to the patients. So we have, when they come in, when they come in whatever, whatever even happened in the hospital, we, have, we can retrieve it and we centralize that in the database. So we have the data. Um, so now we need to use it. So as first example, I'm going to talk to you about the intracranial pressure. It's one of the, the signal that is recorded continuously for traumatic brain injuries. And so it's normal to have some kind of pressure that is applied to the brain. And that's measured with a sensor, uh, in this case, in the brain, that is uh, in the ventricle. Um, and the pressure it's fine. Like if it's it's it should be it, it can vary depending on the people. But when you have a, a tra traumatic brain injury, this can be disrupted and can can really peak to very dangerous values, and that can cause additional injuries to the brain. So what happens is the monitors they are set to have a threshold to 20 millimeter mercury per second. Uh, 20 millimeter mercury. Whenever that that threshold is um, is crossed for more than five seconds, there is an alarm that goes off. And so, and in this case, there are a few false alarms here that were triggered because they, the threshold was crossed. And then uh, at this point, it was a true alarm and then action was taken to reduce it. So that the way they do that, they, they drain some CF set uh, food from the brain so that it reduces the pressure. Um, so that's an, an, an example of false alarms. Like the, the dark line is when um, there was 
the, the alarm was triggered. But you can see that it's, it's due to noise, mostly. So, as a computer scientist or engineer, you can see that it's very simplistic that to just apply a simple threshold on the continuous time series to detect changes. You, we can't do better than that. Um, so we try to do better than that. And so to test that, we, we applied some supervised learning. Uh, we try to set up the, the problem as a supervised learning problem, where you just want to classify um, the, the segment of ICP before uh, the alarm. So we, we retrospectively um, collected the data and analyzed them. So the alarm was here, and we extract 20 minutes before, and we want to say, was it a true alarm or a false alarm? So it's basic classification problem. Um, the specificity about the signal is that it's pulse attack. So if you take a, take a look at a final scale, you can actually see a pulse like this. And, and this pulse has, has a meaning. It's related to the heartbeat, and it's, um, it has a specific shape with, with three peaks. Um, so we design an algorithm to track the shape of the pulse in real time, and it's, uh, we extract 26 metric features from that signal. So we don't have so that's an example of tracking here uh, for the three beats. But we have, in addition to that, 20, 23 other um, features. But anyway, so we have a times, not only one time series, but we extract 26 of them. So we have 26 time series for each uh, segment of data. Um, so it would be, we, we did some we could use those time series directly and feed them to a classifier and see how it works. Um, and then try to, to find what are the features that are interesting. Um, what we did is to reduce, we tried to reduce the dimensionality because obviously if we try to match that directly to, uh, or those um, trends directly, it might not uh, offer good results. So we did some supervised dimensionality reduction um, using an algorithm. Uh, from the side. Um, it's, it's a very simple algorithm. It's just take, you would just build, um, yeah, first I have to tell you why we do that. Um, what we, another, another thing we know is that the shape here of this pulse is actually affected by the average pressure. So we, we know that, it's, that like that is a relationship between the two, so we want to, to represent that, and we do that by by representing the, by projecting the time series of each of the 26 feature in a, in a subspace, basically. And this subspace is adaptively um, optimized. So the size of each bin, of each of the bin here is, is um, optimized using that, uh, that algorithm, which, which basically separates the, the try to separate, maximize the separability, separability between the classes. So once we get that um, projection, uh, that space, that jump space, we can actually project any new time series in that subspace. And then we, we just count how many times each observation felt in that bin. So in this case, um, it would be like three, 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 and four. That would be my feature vector. Um, I mean, if you, it's, a, it's any other dimensionality reduction can be used, but we just used this one um, because it was fast and it seems to work pretty well. Um, and it, so it's supervised, unlike, like, so it's an additional thing. Like, all these segments were an previously annotated manually. Uh, so it makes the problem easier. So if we compare what we get by using a a kernel discriminant analysis. Uh, so it's, it's basic regression framework. Um, if we use the threshold that is currently used in the monitors, we have an AUC of 55%, which is pretty bad. It's almost, it's a barely better than chance. Um, and if we use the regression, so it's nonlinear regression that was uh, published by Deng Kai in 2007. If we use that and we use the dimensionality reduction, we can get up to 85% um, in terms of AUC, so it's the black that you see here, and the, the green one is the threshold. So it's, it's amazing when we saw that, wow, that's, that's 
that's amazing. You should replace the, the monitors and use that. Well, the problem is it's a bit misleading because um, for an alarm, an alarm system to be good, you want it to miss, not to miss any true alarm. You want it to be perfect on true alarms. So this is, we don't actually, with the only portion we care in this curve is, is the really top one. It's here, like where the, the sensitivity is pretty high. So you want to keep that. You cannot allow it to, to miss uh, much of them. So, and if you look at it that, that way, the threshold is actually pretty good at staying up here for a while. It only drops at this one. So, and so the improvement is not very significant here. Um, so, I mean, I just show you that. I mean, it's not published yet, but um, so we need to use an optimization framework that is not based on AUC because here we train on our, our classifier based on, by maximizing AUC on the you know on the training set. But what we should do is actually have a um, another measure of accuracy that is really related to what we want to get uh, eventually at the end. So that's the first uh, application that I had to show you. And it, it really um, demonstrates that we can really do better than just threshold. Like, it's just um, common sense for machine learning guys. Like, um, it's really even surprising that it's, it's still implemented in the uh, in the monitors. Anyway, uh, the second uh, application I want to talk to you about is about super alarms. Super alarms are just as a combination of alarms that that occur co-occur together um, frequently. And we want to see if those super alarms can help to predict um, code blue. So code blue is is a, a code used in the ICU when there is something uh, urgent, when the, when the patient needs immediate uh, medical attention. Um, so we want to be able to see if, if there is some patterns in all these alarms, even being false or true, with, without any annotation about the alarms. But if there is some patterns that they all co-occur um, together. And so it was just published by my colleagues um, last month. Um, so to do that, what we did is, I think there is a, like the initial set of alarms is a few hundred. So there are a few hundred different alarms that can be triggered. And we analyzed them among 150 patients with code blue, so they had like an immediate uh, attention needed with uh, regards to 1,700 controls. And to, 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 to be able to find these discriminant occurrences, we tried to find alarms um, that were triggered in the same window before a code blue. Um, and so we tried to find th those alarms so, um, that were frequent in the, the positive cases, and so more than 10% and less than 10% in the controls. So that gives us a, way, like a crude way to find, is, is there something there, is, are there, is there features combination of features that appear more in, in the code group patient than the controls. And what we found is actually there is. The, the, um, so these are the single alarms. So those are the, the, the alarms that are made of a combination of two single alarms and, and three here. So only three of them are a combination of three alarms. And those alarms, um, we try to see, well, can we use that uh, to predict, to, to do the prediction now? Because we, we, we just did a, a static analysis, but we did not predict that. So we, what we did is to, to use those features, and um, I mean, you should refer to the paper for the details, but, but to do like some cross-validation and uh, to come up with a classifier that would predict the code blue event on this patient. And in this case, what we found is rather interesting, is that for a certain, so here is the sensitivity for a given false positive rate, so specificity. And here is um, the time to the code blue. So it means that you can actually get improvement up to four hours. So it means that 
the combinations that you see here, some of them were detected and were useful even up to three hours before the event. What does that, so that tells you that there is information buried in those alarms way before the time of the, the, the code blue or the emergency. So that, if we can do that um, um, and find what are those, and like, I think it's, it's, comes, it's going to be um, a sort of revolution in the medicine, like how medicine works. Because currently, um, the treatment of a patient in the ICU is reactive. What, mostly, like the nurse is there and she reacts to any abnormal, abnormal value, any alarms. Can we do better than that? Well, if we have a software that it would be good to have better monitors that tells you when the alarm is, that only gives you true alarms, but that's not enough because once the alarm is triggered, you have to act very fast, you don't have time. You have to, um, so there was this sense of urgency. Well, if you could design a machine learning model, a predictive model that can predict those alarms before they happen, then you give some time to the nurse to react. If you, even if you give her one minute or two minutes, you can actually save a lot. Um, and that's what I did in, in, in a paper that just got published. We were able to predict increase of ICP several minutes before the actual ICP. And we did that by, by analyzing the shape of the ICP pulse, so the, basically the signal. And, and in that signal, we could find predictors of, um, of intracranial hypertension. So that, that's my contribution on this one. Thank you. Sometimes better signals give you like 24 hours in advance, like uh, blood uh, analysis and urine analysis and things like that. So they found that that actually they not only gave more time, but they also gave frequently better results. I don't know if you were using that in, the, in your machine learning techniques, but if you're not, you should consider it. Mm -hmm. um, well, th there are different aspects, yeah. Um, I know for, it depends on which modality you're using, um, but I know for the cardiac arrest, um, it can be seen much sooner than a few minutes, like it's hours, and, yeah, and you don't days, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Um, so different sensors, we had sort of different responses, and they're gonna have different sensitivities, et cetera. <laughs> Um, are you, how are you sort of explicitly calibrating or implicitly calibrating for the differences between beds, essentially? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the ICP, that's problematic because whatever you see in the signal is not the true ICP. Okay, there is a, a mismatch and um, it can be shifted. And people have shown that the ICP can actually be shifted on the same patient, if, it, if you have two probes, um, the value can be off. So you cannot really trust that, and that's the reason why. Um, but in this case, we, we, we account for that here because we, we describe the shape with irrespectively of the uh, uh, like uh, absolute value. But, you know, but the variance may also be different yeah. than the actual noise properties, um, yeah. not just the actual amount of variance, but the actual probability of yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a limitation, definitely. Um, it works on, like, it, so one limitation is that we can have a predictive model for 
for the patient we have in our ICU, which, which are monitored with a specific type of sensor. But that doesn't mean that if we apply this framework on an, another uh, type of probe that it's going to work, maybe there might be some differences, yeah. The other question I had was, um, you know, one of these events clearly is not going to be uncorrelated with another event that the patient had, you know, two hours ago. It, is this able? Is this algorithm able to sort of adapt to the fact that if you've had one event, you know, an hour ago, there's a higher probability of you having one now, or are they treated essentially completely as independent triggers? Yeah, in this in this case, it was independent. I think one more interesting thing that you illustrate is that a lot of thought needs to be put into what are the appropriate measures of performance. Your specific point about the area of the curve and that not working very well for what you care about. Yeah. There's another one where you're looking at your false positive rate, your sensitivity, and the delays. I mean, you've got, say, I don't remember exactly where all that oh, were, yeah, but uh, a couple of these I strike me as being. Um, uh, a pulse positive rate of 10% and a sensitivity of around 80%, uh, considering that you had 1,700 non-code blues and 100 oh, blues, yeah, yeah. means that that's going to be yeah, yeah. a noise. Yeah, yeah. The 2%, 60% was actually looking like that's starting to be useful. Right, it, and no, it's what, yeah, sorry. How to actually say that, hey, th this is going to be giving alarms that are going to be useful, and how do we measure the usefulness of the alarms, I think becomes an Another interesting uh, issue in the work, and I'd like you to comment on what have you found to get the commissions to buy into? Let's use this. Right. <laughs> Very good point. Um, yeah, for this, I honestly, uh, I believe that my colleagues did a good job to evaluate, and that they they evaluate on a they reported on on a, on the split, like an even uh, test set, but I'm not sure they exactly that did it. But um, yeah, obviously your point is right. Um, about the implementation in, in the real uh, ICU, we have other projects that, that are focusing on that, and we are like interacting with them, uh, giving them prototypes um, with the nurses, and like so that we have a lot of exchange with them to to ha to have it accepted. That's actually taking even more time than, than building the models. I have a question in regards to the labeling of your data. You show uh, some raw curves for uh, trying to predict code blues. Yeah. Oh. Is that, that's what you're showing? Yeah, this one. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you label what a code blue is? Uh, like Presumably, you need sort of an expert to look at all the data and say, OK, something's wrong here. That's a code blue. Uh, I wasn't sure it was automatically labeled. Oh, for these, yeah, it's it's um, it's uh, automatically acquired through the network uh, here. So we have the, the alarms and like code blue is a part of it. And in another slide, you had some like uh, sort of uh, like it looked like thresholds with like yeah there were lots of numbers and stuff uh, that you were thresholding. Um, it was like a slide with like thirty. Oh, lines or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not what? No, no, no. Okay. It, it was a slide of text. Um, it's kind of hard to read, but uh, this one. No, no. That one. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Where are you getting those numbers, and why? If they're sort of like you know fixed, why uh, are are you learning them? And if not, why not? Um, so those are <coughs> single alarms. So each of them corresponds to something. Um, um, and they are set. Some of the, the, those values are preset. So it's it's a range sometimes, like here. Um, those are standard alarms. We don't act on them. They are just are given to us through the system. Um, so it's not. We cannot act on that. But we could, actually, because we have access to the raw data. So we could try to see if we could refine those combinations. We could tune them using you know, machine learning. Um, but yeah, here it's just uh, given to us, and that's the input we have. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I'd like to thank, thank uh, Fabien and the rest of our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, did you by any chance take the <coughs> one? Oh, no, we didn't. Oh. Okay. Is it okay? and I'm going to talk to you about how can machine learning um, be used monitors for different things such as uh, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature. So when there's something wrong, like if the value is abnormal, there is a sound that, that, that is triggered by those monitors and, and it attracts the attention of the nurse, which in turn take the appropriate action to, to solve the problem, right? So it looks like a pretty good setting, and um, in, in theory, it should work pretty well. <coughs> the issue is that 85% of the amounts are false. Are, they are false positive, which means that it has it, it caused two major problems. One of them is recognized as alarm fatigue, which which is related to the nurse, because most of the most of the alarms are. Our last speaker for the afternoon is Fabian Scalzo. He's an assistant researcher, and also at uh, in LA, but in this case at the neurosurgery um, department at uh, the UCLA Hospital and neural in the neural working in the neural systems and dynamics lab. And he will present his work on pattern recognition methods for efficient alarm-based patient monitoring. So I think that will dovetail very nicely on the previous slide. Thank you. Yeah, it's perfect timing. Perfect schedule. <laughs> Similarities with other uh, control rooms where you have lots of data, such as like, um, like the control room of a nuclear power plant here, or for the cockpit, cockpit of an aircraft. Um, the difference is that the pilot is the nurse, and she's driving the recovery of the patient using uh, different devices, um, as it was uh, introduced by Dave earlier. So those devices can be helpful to to provide assistance for. For example, for respiratory assistance or medication administration automatically. And some of the devices are just monitors. They just continuously monitor some vitals from the patient and they, um, and they report that on, on, on those screens, different screens, different monitors to improve monitoring systems in the ICU. So it's related to what they was presenting. And, um, so I'm from UCLA, uh, which is a big hospital. It's about 500 beds. It employs more than a thousand nurses, and it's about 40,000 uh, ER admissions per year. And I work in a, in neurosurgery with with different uh, with people from different backgrounds. Like some of them are neurosurgeons, some of them are computer scientists, and some of them are biomedical engineers. And we work together um, on problems such as the intensive care unit. And when you look at it from a perspective of, of a computer scientist, the intensive care unit is actually an intensive data analysis center. And 